you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Streeters, Tamara here, your innovation enabler and the person that pretty much messes up every analogy possible. You will hear it in the interview today. I just, I don't know. I just can never get them right. Maybe somebody can help me with that. All right. With that said, let's move on to the interview. Today, I interviewed Heather Kluter. She is an innovation thought leader, had an amazing experience at Hyundai, actually going from zero innovation culture to actually being part of the team that drove it across the organization and had a massive impact, not just internally, but also on the company's products and what cars they launched and brought to market and how they thought about it. I brought her on because not only because I love innovation, obviously, but because she has some real insight into what it takes when you're pushing up against a legacy system or a system that maybe values kind of status quo or kind of not shaking things up and and trying to shift that culture from that to one of innovation in a way that actually impacts the outcome. We talked a lot of, about a lot of things. We talked about, you know, how to break down those silos that create that not created here mentality or that didn't get it right because they didn't involve all the people and the right people. How the little things make the big impact. And for launch treaters out there, I want you to pay close attention to that because one of the frustrations that I know you have, I know I have, is we see the big vision and we want those people on the other side of the table to buy into that big vision to the whole kit and caboodle. But sometimes they just need a little piece of it before they can buy into the whole thing. Now, I use this horrible cake analogy in the interview because I couldn't come up with anything else, but I think you'll get the point. Sometimes getting a yes on something small is a step towards the big yes. It doesn't mean we didn't accomplish our innovation goals. So pay attention to that. We talked about discovery teams, about ethnographies versus focus groups, pouring sugar on Honey Nut Cheerios. All right, it's time to dig in. Heather, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Tamara. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? So people are surprised to learn that I have become a dog lover. Um, I've always had cats and I've not been very sympathetic to the amount of catering that people give to their dogs these days. So I've been kind of vocal about that. But my kids had been asking for a dog for five years. And I told my oldest that he had to read a book about Huskies because that's the kind of dog he wanted, interview a vet, price out the cost of having a dog and figure out all the preparations. And um, after reading half the book, he came to me and he said, no other kid has to do this to get a dog. I'm not doing it. (laughs) And so I said, that's fine, but you're not getting a dog. Uh, Five years later, he did an enormous PowerPoint presentation. He did all the interviews and everything he was supposed to do. So I was forced to get the dog. And as it turns out, I love her more than I ever imagined I would. And the highlight of my day is taking her off leash for a run on the trails by our house. And nothing makes me happier than seeing her just race across the hills. So I have to eat all my words about what I've said about dog people over the years. Okay. So first of all, did you end up with a husky? Yes. Because they are. So I had a husky for many years. They're amazing dogs. Very independent, but amazing. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I have a 90 pound Mastiff, so I'm all about the dogs, but that's oh funny. I, I don't know that I've ever had to do a PowerPoint in my life to get a dog. I'm more <laughs> just like, you know, I took my ex to the pound. Like, how do you say no when you go to the pound? You know, <laughs> right. I made my parents come with me once. Like, it's just, it's an, it was an emotional experience is what I created. <laughs> I, I know. Well, you know, I just always hear so many things from my friends, especially mom friends who say, well, it's the mom who always takes care of the dog. And so I didn't want to, you know, have that on me, but now I just, I'm hooked. Well, I will tell you this. I don't know how old your kids are, but I have a almost 14 year old and 10 year old boy and they are the dog walkers. So I love it, but I make them do it almost every day. And I think it's my dog's highlight, but I'm the, 
you know, I'm the one who does the heavy lifting for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. But that's right. Pounds, you're in shape. <laughs> yeah, right. But she, you know, she's also curled up at my feet right now while I'm working. So I'll take it. Um, so uh-huh. Heather, you know, you had mentioned that many companies today still miss the boat on innovation. What are they doing wrong? So, yeah, I, I work with a lot of companies. And when I first started really getting into innovation, I was working with Hyundai. And so focusing on that one company and what could we do better. And now I've crossed over more into the consulting side. So I work with companies across many industries, not just automotive, um, retail, healthcare, still automotive, but, you know, lots of different places, fast food. Um, And what I see, one of the big things that I see is that we're just still not breaking down our silos and people are still not doing the best job that they can do of working together. So when I have a client come to me and want to start an engagement and then they say, okay, well, let's you and I meet and then I'll talk to my internal clients and I'll come back to you. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. Like you're not on the team. Something's wrong here. And engagements that start like that almost never end well because somebody who has to use whatever you've created in that process, in that engagement is not going to be happy either because they weren't in on it in the beginning. So that not created here kind of idea or um, you didn't get it right and they weren't asked to give their input. So I think one of the big things is that we just continue to have these siloed environments. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I was kind of flashing back to some clients I've had in the consumer packaged goods world and food world. And what was fascinating to me, and I I bet you've seen this over and over again, is they would have these quote unquote innovation teams. And those people to kind of, to your point, would go off and do something. And then they'd lob that tennis ball over the net. And the person on the other side's ducking and weaving because (laughs) of the, exactly the things you said. And and I think also too, for them, it's just another thing to add to their to-do list because they weren't involved (laughs) versus something to get excited about. Um, And the other layer that I'd love to get your perspective on too, is I find that that focus on innovation ebbs and flows versus stays consistent. So the willingness to even invest in those type of initiatives kind of ebbs and flows with leadership, the marketplace, um, like suddenly it's the hot thing and it's all the rage and the 10 people that get to do it are super cool. And then they cut it because they didn't get the results they want. And then they come back to the same thing three years later. I see that all the time. And in fact, we kind of experienced that at Hyundai. Um, you know, we, we had zero innovation culture and nothing happened in the U.S. Everything came from Korea and just, hey, take this and implement it. And we started to change that to the point where we got all the way to creating our own separate innovation office. And we could talk about that more later. But what happened was when the few of us, really the three of us who had it gotten that going and we all left around the same time within the same year for various reasons, it didn't stick. And so as you're saying, it can blow with the wind either because you don't get results and um, or you can't quantify them or, you know, lots of reasons that that have to do with results and not being able to sort of prove the ROI of that kind of investment, or it just didn't stick with, um, it didn't get ingrained in the culture. And as you mentioned, somebody in management supported, and then maybe that person moved on and then someone new comes. So it's hard to get it to be ingrained enough that it sticks around consistently. So so will you talk more about your Hyundai experience? Because you kind of alluded to it a few times. I'd love to kind of hear some more depth around that. Yeah, so um, it was a fascinating time to be there because, so this is going back, date myself for when I started (laughs) there. I was there for almost a decade, but when I started, it was right when the dot-com thing was blowing up. I had come off a failed dot-com experience, exhilarating experience, but didn't walk away with the millions, you know, that everyone hoped for from (laughs) dot-com. So I'm like, oh, gotta go back and get a real job now. Where could I go? And so I, I went to work with Hyundai And I was excited because I thought, you know, I I didn't have much interest in going to the biggest brand and my goal would be keep them on top. You know, I thought this is a struggling brand. It's a pretty flat organization, not huge. You know, there's opportunity to really make impact. Um, And so when I went there, the brand was struggling. You know, they had brought very poor quality products into the U.S. The 
customer base was basically a captive resentful base, right? Just, I don't have money, so I have to buy your car and I don't like that, but I'm stuck with you. And so, but, you know, in a Korean company, when the chairman mandates something, it happens and the chairman mandated quality. And so they started working on quality and they started making quality cars and they started backing it up with the 10 year warranty. And then people started taking another look, but you know, it was still a, uh, still uh, difficult. We were still getting product that was created in Korea and just forced upon this market. It wasn't the right product. So we spent a lot of time trying to convince them that we needed to be able to control that here in the U S if we really wanted to get them the results that we, that they wanted. Um, and so that was my experience in the beginning. And really, when we thought about innovation, it was a small group of us. We didn't have official permission to do anything. We didn't have an official title or a budget. We had nothing, but we just thought we kind of, we think we know some things that are going to be the right things to do. So let's try to go off and do them. And it was little things. I mean, sometimes it was just, let's take a field trip to the Sunset Design Home because we know there's a lot of new thinking there that we can apply to our concepts, whether it be technology or the way people use small spaces or the way people use uh, materials and colors, et cetera. Um, let's go visit some boats one day because, you know, boats have small spaces they need to organize. How can we put that into our vehicles? So some of that was just us saying, we're going to jet out of the office for a couple hours and go check out this stuff. And then we're going to come back and start to talk about it in our planning meetings and as we develop product. And then it grew from there um, uh, up to, like I said, we ultimately were successful enough to create a separate office that was away from the corporate sales office, which is in Southern California. It was away from the design office, which is also in Southern California. And then it was separate from the engineering office, which is in Detroit. So this was a fourth office, if you wanna call it that, where all those groups could come together on neutral ground because those groups were pretty territorial. They all reported up into separate management streams in Korea, and they were really encouraged not to work together very closely. I have so I've actually three big questions for you. So I'm gonna this was fantastic. So I'm gonna loop back um, and start okay. with that and kind of work through. So one is, I'm curious how you were able to paint the picture to get buy-in to do this to begin with. And, and I'm I'm partially asking because I've had multiple conversations recently with. Um, innovation officers at various companies, uh, large companies with a lot of structure, or global, you know, businesses, um, and the biggest one of the biggest frustrations they have is that initial buy-in to even do some of these initiatives. So, looking back, what do you think were some of the keys to even getting that yes to start? Well, and, and I guess because it was just so small and incremental, the steps that we took, and we didn't advertise it at first as, you know, I don't even think we knew. We, we didn't set out down and say, in five years, we'll have an innovation office and it'll be separate. And this is the way the team structures will look and we'll have a core team and extended team. And this is how it will happen. We really did not, I can't say we were that genius and thought about how can we get yeah. there. We just really tried to take the baby steps and fly under the radar um, and then just taking little bits of budget, you know, so first it was nothing and it was three of us just doing it on our lunch hour or a couple hours out of the office in the afternoon. And then we created like a day or two event where we were able to put some research in it. And because it was research, we were able to get some funding and then we kind of squeezed a little few events in that weren't wouldn't be considered exactly research. Um, for example, when trying to design the first U.S. made Santa Fe, we had done segmentation research. So Korea, in most companies, you know, they want some foundational quantitative research sure. to guide you. And that's important. And I totally believe in that. And we had done some unmet needs segmentation where we were understanding what wasn't happening in the SUV market at the time. And what might we be able to do to make it better? So we came up with a design language that we called assertive grace. And that's what we wanted the Santa Fe to look like. And so when we thought about, okay, let's do some research now. And we sold it through, honestly, as focus groups groups. Hey, bring a few people from Korea, some planners. We're going to have some designers and engineers from the U.S. and we're going to have some focus groups uh, and maybe we'll do a couple other activities. Right. And, and so, oh, by the way, <laughs> we might throw in yeah. a few other things. 
<laughs> yeah. So, hey, by the way, one of them is when you showed up in the morning, we're going to drive you out to an ice rink where we have an Olympic medal skater who's going to skate around. He's a speed skater because we think that that embodies the idea of assertive grace, right? Mm. It's a sport that there's a lot of power. And when you're yes. standing on the ice and feeling him move around you with such speed, but so graceful, that imp- imp- implanted or imprinted in people's minds and then we did the focus groups and um you know so we went from there and so it just grew and we just started getting management on board um with little successes uh little bits of research along the way that were seeming to show that we were on the right path so that leads into my second question, which I think in some ways you talked about. And just for launch readers out there, I really want you to hear what Heather's saying about just these tiny little steps that you and the team took, you know, starting with two hours after lunch to go somewhere to kind of a little more and a little more and a little more. I think sometimes when it comes to these things that we want to do, the more innovative things, whether that's creating a culture of innovation or launching new products, um, we tend to try to go for the whole boat immediately. That's a horrible Mm -hmm. analogy. I just can't think of a good one, but you know what I'm saying? Like we (laughs) try to eat the whole cake at once. Right. And sometimes we just got to let it happen a bite at a time, knowing where we're headed. And, um, you know, that's hard. I think that's hard because we see the vision, you know, the innovators and companies and entrepreneurs, we know what's possible, but the people around us don't yet. So we have to kind of slowly, but surely take them there. And that led to my second question, which I think you kind of answered, but which is really was around, it seems like the little steps you took helped to get to the bigger. And I would venture to say that if you started with the bigger, it probably wouldn't have worked. I agree with that. I, I don't think it would have worked. I think it's kind of those things where it would have gotten caught up in red tape and, you know, a bureaucratic ideas of who gets to lead and who, you know, people are positioning and posturing for that. Um, and, the, you know, and, and some of the things we found, too, by doing it that way, those little bitty steps, is we started identifying people who are innovators. And they may not have been the people that you'd initially say, hey, let's put together this team and who should we pick? And then, you know, you go through your list and you pick. We started finding people that we wouldn't have initially thought to, to put on that list. And I think because sometimes you're trying to identify those people through their job title. And I don't think that's always the right way to go because, you know, a lot of times they wouldn't ask people in service to help us do innovation or, you know, people in finance. But there are people in those groups who think a certain way and it's not about their job function. It's about the way they think. You can have a lot of people in marketing who aren't good innovators because they don't all necessarily think that way. I love that you said that. I'm a big believer that um, and anyone can be an innovator and the people who rise to the top naturally are not the ones you think oftentimes and have nothing to do with job title. And it, it is much more about the mindset and the approach they have to anything that they do. And it's always fascinating to me when we put together teams because I think people try to identify by job title to your point. And that often fails because those people in the room aren't the right thinkers that we need. Yes, exactly. So here's the third question. I want to dig into this innovation office. And there's a couple reasons why I want to explore this. Um, So one of the challenges that I see a lot with innovation is, you know, it's, and we talked a little bit about this in the beginning, is it's siloed, right? It's these 10 people over here who get to work in the cool office and do cool things. And Mm -hmm. the rest of us are supposed to do our day jobs and we're not the innovative ones. And then we're told by them, Right, what we're supposed to take on is the new innovative initiative, whether that's an internal process or an external product feature, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that tends to create a divide. And so I'm curious how you, with an innovation office where you are offsite, you're bringing people there, how you overcame kind of what you were saying in the beginning about that not created here mentality or they don't get it right because they don't create the whole picture. How do you, so there's kind of two layers to my questions. One is, how do you separate but still enable and bring people into the process? And two, um, and I'm going to ask them together because they probably go hand in hand. For you at that time, what's the value of being offsite when at the same time, right, we want everyone to be a part of the innovation process? So, okay, yeah. So the first part, how did we decide how to structure the teams. Um, What we ended up doing, we had a core team and then an extended team and the extended team people could vary. Um, So the core team really, you know, it was our jobs and we, 
did really come out of a particular discipline, which was brand strategy and advanced product planning. So because those are the teams that really own four, five, six years out. And, you know, the development of a vehicle is about four years. So we were the owners. And then within within that group, we tried to identify the thinkers that would be, um, you know, would have that spark and would have that passion to to want to do this. And then we started filtering people in on extended teams. So they would be, you know, primarily doing their main job in marketing, in service, in finance, but they'd come in at periodic points in the, um, you know, that four-year cycle. And people could be on an extended team for a separate program. So if it wasn't the whole brand, let's say it was a concept for a particular vehicle model. And then maybe, you know, Joe from finance is on the Santa Fe model, extended discovery team but you know susan from service she might be on one for for the sonata or a different model so you brought in people from across the company who are gonna be impacted throughout the 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 process basically in at the right points in the right times right so they were probably in there you know where we're doing this daily um, and we're splitting our time between the innovation office and the corporate office, just, you know, n- not by any particular schedule, but just as needed. Those people might come in once a month, sometimes more often during a heavy period. And mm-hmm. especially when we were doing heavy immersions that were like a whole week long. But, you know, they were usually involved at least once a, once a month, if not more. So they had plenty of time to do their full time, let's say, job but they have plenty of time to come back and feed into this process. And of course they could always talk to us and share anything they were thinking at any time, but um, we made sure to bring them in. So it kind of became, um, you know, people looked at it like, oh, I have a chance to be on a discovery team because there's there's enough of them to go around and it's a privilege to be on that. And what do I get to do to be on it? And I, you know, and the location of our office was interesting, too, because I always debated whether this was a good idea or not. We put it in Newport Beach. So we're down there. I mean, the personally, beach. that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, the first one we chose, which they said no, was waterfront on top of a bar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Management said no. We'll go for Newport Beach, but not the one on top of the bar. So That's we funny. got another one. We found another one, but we were still right there at the beach. And I thought, as you mentioned, you know, you get people sitting in corporate going, oh, really? You mean the people at the beach? We're going to listen yeah. to them. They're just sitting at the beach all day. But then on the flip side, there's motivation. Like, hey, I want to be on the extended team. And then I get to come down and, and be at the beach sometimes. So I don't know. I still don't know if I recommend that or not, but we did it and – That's how it went. Well, you said something earlier about needing to get people out of their offices to think differently. And I can see the value in there, in that 100%. And and having people come in at different places, um, I think at different points is is really important for launch readers out there listening to kind of how how you think about doing this. And I I struggle with innovation happening off-site because I understand the need to have a different space and a different mindset, but I also recognize the barrier that that can also create on the back end because it really is like saying, well, you're all innovative, but you're not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's, you know, particular to the company. I mean, the, yeah. the unique dynamic that you had going on at Hyundai was, so you had, um, you know, an overseas office that really ultimately could control everything, right? Like we we think we're in control here in the US. We finally got control of some of the brand management and the product development. But really, if Korea didn't approve it, we're not doing it. So that leads to, you know, and just the general culture there is it still was very, um, you know, it's a very hierarchical culture. And that was starting to change as you had younger Koreans come up the management chain and they they didn't have that mindset or they had maybe been Western educated or had not always lived in Korea. So they had some different ways of thinking. But in the meantime, just being in, if you said, okay, we're going to meet in the design office, we're going to meet in the engineering office, we're going to meet in the corporate sales office, there already was a... Um, 
I thought of favoritism. I don't know. There was just something about, you know, that was on someone's home turf, those groups that were yeah. supposed to be so separate. Well, I think when you have a territorial issue the way you're talking about, it, it's very different. And I really appreciate what you were saying earlier about bringing in someone from finance, someone from service, someone from sales, whatever, through the process. Because I actually think that's often missed and why that tennis ball just bounces to nowhere because they weren't involved um, through the process. I want to talk with you a little bit about ethnographies versus focus groups. It's like one of my favorite dorky <laughs> innovation topics that makes me so happy. So tell me about your perspective on those. So, yeah. So, well, I, I'm not, I, I will start off by saying I still do a lot of focus groups. I have a lot of clients who want to do focus groups and from time to time, I think they're effective and have their place, but they're not my favorite for a variety of reasons. I think um, one of them is, and they're they're especially not my favorite for innovation because you know their their process in by nature is designed to reach closure within what like a one and a half two hour window, right? Like yeah. we're going to start, we're going to get to know you quickly, mm-hmm. hurry up, get to know you, right. feel comfortable. I'm going to ask us. you one question so you feel yeah. like I want yeah. to know you. Right, right. I'm pretending I do. And now let's move on and dig into it. And then I'm going to show you a bunch of things and you're going to give me your feedback. And then we're going to have an answer in the two hours. And so that's not innovation. You know, I don't think it happens like that. Um, I don't think it happens quickly. I think when you want to get input from people, consumers, I like to do it over time. And think about any meeting you've gone to or anything people have asked you. A lot of times you go home that night and you reflect on that conversation and and you suddenly think of, oh, I wish I would have told that person this. Or you suddenly remembered another experience you had that could have helped um, that group by giving them that information. And so with a focus group, you don't get that chance. You're done. So if you have any great follow-up information for us, we don't get to hear it. Um, You know, it's not a very creative setting. Usually if it's in a focus group facility, it's pretty sterile feeling. And some people try to get around that and do groups in different locations, but most of the time they're in a facility, which I just think is not very creative. Well, and I think the one-way mirror is just creepy. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. I agree. I agree. Um, and, you know, it's again, and it focuses on regular consumers who sometimes have difficulty generating breakthrough ideas. Yeah. Um, I work with a group right now and we call them the imaginators and we've found a way to screen through working with psychologists and different professionals to figure out how to screen for creativity and identify a group of people who are a little bit more creative than the average. And just like we're saying your job title doesn't define that for you if you're trying to create an innovation team at work, this is the same. I mean, people in this imaginator group, they're not all people who are either artists or marketers. They might be plumbers. They might be um, engineer. You know, they might be anyone. It's just the way they think is different. Oh, I love that. And, you know, the, the, um, well, a couple things, you know, to your point about focus groups, and I, I respect that there's a place and a time for them. I really struggle with the, to your point, the lack of the ability to think through, oh, I wish I had, actually, now that I think about that, that's not actually how I do it or, or yeah. what happens. Um, and I, you know, you had kind of mentioned um, to me offsides the ethnographies. I, you know, I love ethnographies, and I'll just give you a very quick example to share why. I think for launch readers out there, it'll really highlight why it is so good to get into people's worlds where they live, whatever it is that you're selling to them. Um, so we, it was to make cereal portable. And that, that was the, the project. We were working for General Mills. And it was so funny, Heather, because we had recruited for people who consider themselves that live a healthy lifestyle. And healthy <laughs> was very vague. But the, with us, we wanted people who were like, yeah, I have a salad every now and again, right? Um, and so we go into this house and we're having breakfast with this woman and she's eating her Cheerios and she's showing us her kitchen. And I look over the kitchen and there's a deep fryer, a very used deep fryer on the counter. And then she opens up her fridge and it's like all monster drinks and like some other, I can't remember what else. I got so distracted by the monster drinks. And then I'll never forget, she's talking to us about how she's healthy and she's spooning sugar onto her Honey Nut Cheerios. And, but, but here's the thing. She, I mean, you and I know this, just for launch readers out there listening, she's not a liar. She believes. Yeah that she is healthy. But if I had brought her into a focus group, her ideal self that she would have shared would not have given me the real context of what was happening in her real life. 
And I struggle with that kind of when you bring people out of their environments to, especially when it comes to innovation. And to your point, they can't solve your challenges. Like that, that's not who they are. They haven't been thinking about it the way we have. And they're frankly, yeah. they're focused on solving today's problem, not thinking to the future like we're charged to do. Right. So it's like the difference is so so stark to me. I mean, I, I spent two hours in a Trans Am. I'm going across the Golden Gate Bridge with a guy who literally sat there with food in one hand the entire time. And this was long before the breakfast bars were all the rage, but it was what made us realize, oh, the package needs to be the napkin and yeah. it needs to be held in one hand. But if he'd come into the conference room or the focus group room, he would have said like, oh no, I just, you know, I take a bite here and there. I It's, it's just so different. That's an that's the perfect example. I'm gonna remember that and use it for yeah. for my future. It's so funny, sugar it's so all over funny. the honey nut. <laughs> but you're right, and I think that's what you zeroed in on is they believe it, and right. so right. you know they believe they're one way, but their life is not exactly always that way. Uh, it reminds me of that thing in Harry Met Sally when he says, "You're the worst kind of woman. You're the high maintenance woman who thinks you're low maintenance." <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so she goes into a group and she talks about herself. It's not how she would be at all. So, um, yeah, we spend a lot of time with ethnography, which, and I still do with clients. And it's tricky because, especially when you have a group that really wants to rely on quantitative information. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I find that the more you can get close to these people, the better. And, and I mean, not even just for a day or two days, like over time, um, which obviously in some industries is short because, you know, if you're doing some programs, some products just come and go and some take a long time, like automobiles, four years. But we use, uh, you know, I like to have people go a step further with their segmentation studies. So use them as foundational. And then, you know, the next step people always do is they they get an algorithm for their keys, one or two segments, and then they start recruiting off that, right? And yeah, then they have those right. people come in a focus group. But then they're kind of going, I don't know. That doesn't sound how I thought it would. Those people don't seem how I thought they would. Well, because again, it's an algorithm. It's a subset of a bunch of questions you asked and how people are supposed to rate. And it's still not perfect. So we often recommend going beyond that if you do identify a segment and then actually interviewing, recruit off an algorithm, bring in a bunch of those people. I've, I've interviewed a hundred to find 10 that we think really nail it. And this is a small group, right? Like it might be a design target. It's never enough to fill your volume when you say, but I've got to go to market. How can I design for, you know, just for Heather when I need Heather and 20,000 million other people to buy this product? Well, we still need to design and develop with a particular person in mind so that we create something that's specific and meaningful. Um, and so we often keep those people around throughout the whole development. Again, just bouncing back to Hyundai, that would be four years. So for Santa Fe, we had a target called Glamour Mom. And we identified 10 real life women who we met with over and over and over again for those four years. And we were involved in every aspect of their life. Um, I've done it for family oriented products. And you can imagine and over time, if you've picked 10 families, let's say in a couple years, a lot changes, right? Their yeah. children grow. They may add children or pets or whatever to the family. Or huskies, but, dogs. Yeah, yeah, huskies, of course. Um, but, you know, they they really become comfortable with you and your learnings just shoot through the roof. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what you're saying with that. Launch traders, I, I think what's really key to take out of that is this idea of kind of long-term customer consumer feedback. And to your point, Heather, you know, kind of, I think your story really showcased it well around, you know, particularly when it comes to, we'll use the car, the life changes. So my needs, in fact, I was just complaining because I don't have a third row in my car. I have two teenage boys. So mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of stuff and boys. <laughs> and like, I feel like I loved my Subaru, but I feel like, oh, if I only had a third row, like so my needs keep changing kind of as my life changes. Um, yeah. So to get that input over time is amazing and so much more valuable than just this kind of, you know, one time meet. It's like speed dating almost. Like, yeah. how do you really know? 
And you know what I think is awesome that we have it and it just continues to get better for us now is technology. So, you know, in the Mm. past we had to do everything in person and I still really love the in-person touch and I think you need to build that rapport, but it doesn't mean that once you've got those people, every time you have to be there in person, you know, we've got the ability to connect with them virtually and, and save time and money and make it faster, but still get some great insights. So I think blending the, the the use of technology with that in person touch is a, is a good way to go. Yeah, we have I have a healthcare client and we do these innovation panels with their clients. And what I loved about the process, and I really didn't even realize this until you were just talking, is that we uh, you know we start with them. Let's call it day one, and we hear what their priorities are, their biggest challenges, and you know we kind of track that. And then what I really come to realize is in that eighteen months, those things drastically change. So had we just come in once and built our product roadmap around that initial conversation, we actually would have missed the mark and been too late because we yeah. weren't evolving with them, which I think is kind of a little bit of what you're saying of like, where, where are they headed? Not just where are they right now? You're right. And I'm sure you've got clients. I've got everybody, every client I have coming to me about customer journey work, you know, the new buzzword, which is fine. We've all always been doing customer journey work, yeah. but now we can just call it that if we want. Right. But again, but to your point, it's not going to be the best if we just take it off some quantitative survey and we try to understand the whole journey right then and there. It, you know, we got to put some effort into these things if you really want to do it well. So talk to me a little bit about how do you, so with all the kind of challenges we've talked about and some of the hurdles, how do you get companies to think bigger? Well, I, I mean, I think sharing innovation success is one thing. And I, and so just being able to talk to them about some other companies who and introduce them. What I f- found is that companies are really willing to share. And so yeah. I love to, you know, I think every industry that I talk to, they want to tell you why theirs is so specific and so right. unique. So unique. Right? Extremely can't, can't unique. Here. We're only, we can only work with these people because nobody else understands us. We're so special. And I'm like, okay, there are special things about you. Everyone's special. Like yes. moms or kids, right? right but, totally. <laughs> but if you really want to get too myopic, I think it's an innovation killer. And so to start, one thing I like to do is to be able to connect these people to other companies. And um, sometimes it can be like through a, um, a half day session, you know, working with um, like there's a group I love called the Luxury Council. And sometimes I work with them and most of the work they do is in New York because that's where a lot of their clients are. But let's say I'm working for um, you know, a luxury, uh, let's say a cruise line and we want to do some work with them and they are trying to understand, um, a certain segment, let's say it's a high end cruise line, a certain segment of luxury buyer that is also important to American express. And it's important to, um, architectural digest. And it's important to all kinds of companies that deal with that same consumer, even though they make a different product or a different service, get in there and have a half day session because these are non-competing groups. I find like vice president levels and above willing to come to these half day sessions and share. And it's really impactful, I think, for helping companies understand that they just can open their eyes and start looking and talking to people within their company and outside their company and really be doing some things um, better than they're doing now. Launch readers out there listening, I I want you to think about what other industries and businesses can you tap into that have a similarity to yours? So you mentioned luxury, right? That was the connecting factor. Mm -hmm. And I I just, I think it's so important what you're saying about getting out there and connecting with others who are dealing with similar challenges or trying to market similar things. Um, And I think you're right. I think people are shockingly willing to share because they're going to get value out of it too. And, you know, I love the kind of concept of, is it luxury? Is it, um, I don't know, what are some other ones out there? Travel? Is it whatever? Or yeah. even, are you guys suffering from the same challenge? So a shifting consumer mindset. Um, Uber Eats is disrupting your business because you're all like deliver something. Um, yeah. There's so many ways to look at it, but I think what you're saying is so important. So for launch readers out there, make a list. See who you can connect with that is a different industry, but similar in 
challenge, value, brand, or whatever it is. Do you, and actually, let me ask you this, Heather. Do you have a way to think about that? So if I'm out there listening, how can I think about who I would want to connect with? Well, I think you've got to think about what what is your um, consumer group experiencing and comparing you to, mm. right? So let's say, again, auto is just such an easy one because I do so much of it, but it's something everyone can understand. So one area there that... Um, is always excluded because automotive doesn't own retail, but that's changing. But, you know, right. The dealerships are independent and no, we work with our top dealers and we try to influence dealers in certain ways, but we don't control it. So most of our effort, we're not looking there and I'm saying, okay, but, everyone's comparing their horrible car buying experience, their wonderful, everything else buying. (laughs) Right. Right. So let's think about where are they getting great experiences and then bringing those experiences back and comparing them to us. So it could be about your product. It could be about your service. It could be about your processes. It could be any of that. Um, So I think when you think about who, what are your buyers doing and how, who might they be comparing you to that might be a lot better than you? And that's setting some expectation. You know, you start, you think about, oh, well, what are my competitors doing? And they're setting expectations. Well, that's too small. Yeah. And I, I would say that, um, particularly when it comes to looking at competitors, I feel like that's just a, a, a game of, I call it the ER trap. It's like a little better, stronger, faster, but they can yeah. always out better, stronger, faster you tomorrow. So right. everybody's playing on the same hamster wheel. I like what you're saying, which is the idea of kind of going out to come back in. And like, if you're in the, you know, library world, um, I, I remember them talking about who else builds communities because that's what we're trying to do. So let's look at like extreme sports events like Tough Mudder. They actually build communities. CrossFit builds yeah. communities. Communities. Like, how do you, how do you, and to your point, how do you think about what you're really selling and what the customer's experiencing um, from you, which is a big part of it. Now, before we run out of time, where can people go to learn and connect with you? Um, well, I mean, they can always find me on LinkedIn, and that's an easy way to connect. That goes right to my email. Um, I, you know, sometimes guest lecture from time to time. I'm guest lecturing right now for Boston University for their innovation program. So people can, um, you know, talk to me if they ever want to just just try to connect. So I can give you my email address if you want. I, I do blogs from time to time. Um, mostly they're with a group I'm working with right now called Decision Analyst and they're on their website. But I have links to them on my LinkedIn as well. Excellent. I would say launch readers go to LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. That's like the perfect place to connect. Yeah, me um, too. So Heather, this has been so great. What's the one piece of advice you have for launch launch readers looking to kind of have a breakthrough in innovation? I think just don't don't worry about structure, approval, or budget in the beginning. You know, don't worry about all that. Just start with your own curiosity and do little homegrown free activities that you can begin to show people that there are um, valuable ideas and valuable things you can bring to the process and then let it go from there. And, you know, but of course, once you get there, once you feel that you've created enough of those to to try to sell them in, look, look around at your executive management and identify the ones that you think would be most open to this and then start to try to connect with them if you're not already connected because, you know, it might not even be your direct line of management, but you can see, hey, this person over here in this other group, I can tell just from meetings I go to or presentations I see, seems like the kind of person that would be open to this and try to get to know them. I love that. And I'm going to add, because I just can't get enough of it, of kind of what you were saying in the beginning about um, those small steps being okay and not to not to be frustrated just because you didn't you know eat the whole cake. I've got to come up with a new analogy. I just don't have one right now. Um, I love cake. Yeah, so do I. Which is why maybe that's why I'm stuck on it right now because I'm hungry. Uh, but you know, like I I think that innovators in organizations, regardless of your title, often get frustrated because we try to sell the whole cake at once. And all they can really, all the people on the other side can really take in that moment is a bite, and one bite at a time will get you to the whole cake. Um, you can't always do the whole cake at once. So I, I loved what you were saying and the stories you were sharing in the beginning about the kind of small steps that you took and how that led to the big picture. I think that 
if you try to be the lone person selling a great idea, I, I don't always think that's the best way. And some people do that for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're, you know, afraid that others won't get on board or some people, they just kind of want to keep something for themselves and then ultimately maybe, you know, get the glory from that if it comes. Mm -hmm. But I think that the best innovation um, and the best way to sell is through a group effort. And, you know, I, I even think if you have an idea that never changed, which this really won't happen, but let's say it never changed from inception to launch. But the one difference in that idea was, that you had a more inclusionary group trying to push it through, I think that's going to be more like the best, most fabulous idea that just one person just keeps trying to get through. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. I think collaboration uh, really is the key to getting, not just to innovation and having the idea be stronger, but also getting momentum because mm -hmm. that's half the battle, isn't it? It's not just getting coming yeah. up with the idea. It's getting buy-in along the way. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. You become an innovator and a salesperson for lack of a better word. Right. right. Exactly. We need to, we need to coin some kind of like, you know, ales, like a innovation salesperson. That's sounded really weird when I said it out loud, but something so like we that. We have two homeworks. We need to fix, work on the cake analogy. Right. And yeah. a, new, <laughs> a new label. <laughs> this is what happens when you have no filters and you just say stuff. It's like, that didn't come out right, but we're recording. So, oh, well, Heather, thank you so much. This has been very insightful and launch readers out there. I, I have no doubt that you took copious notes and are going to go connect with some people and some businesses and make some innovation happen. So Heather, thank you. Thank you. I've learned a lot from all your podcasts and I share them with a lot of people I know. So I'm, I'm really privileged to be part of it this time. Before you go, Launch Streeters, I got one thing for you to do. It's the action that I'm actually going to take today as well. I want you to go out and find one person who's not in your industry but shares a similar challenge or as Heather talked about the same type of experience that you deliver to your customers or your clients, I want you to find one of those people and I want you to connect with them to have a conversation about what's going on in your world. What are the challenges? What are they doing to overcome those challenges? I'm going to do that today as well. I think what she said there around collaborating with people in industries and businesses that share the same problem or that same experience with you is so powerful in driving innovation. Can you go do that? All right. Why don't you go do that? And then let me know how it goes. Until next time, Tamara out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.